Thank you for joining me here. Let's uh, discuss, well, AI, generative AI, and explore together the frontiers between maybe so-called open source LLMs, large language models, and commercial APIs, all right? And explore those uh, sometimes shady or fuzzy waters. Uh, I'm Raphael Simete. I'm head of DevRel in a, in a payment company. Uh, I'm also an open source expert and a senior architect. Worldline is a, uh, who, who knows Worldline in the room? Oh, I'm quite impressed. <laughs> all right. Uh, so we're known for all the payment business when you pay on the internet or when you use a terminal, you know, to do your, your payment. But basically what we do is we deal with a large amount of uh, very uh, huge uh, number of transactions or criticals like payment, but also health or transportation, for instance. Right. And that's it for Worldline. So let's speak about large language model. So language, it's all about semantics. We all agree that AI is uh, almost as old as uh, IT and computing uh, science. Uh, more recently, a few years ago, uh, language models were existing already, but the results were, for, were of uh, quite poor quality compared to what we have now today. Everything changed in uh, 2017 with the publication of the Attention is All You Need uh, paper by Google Research, introducing the transformer architecture, and that unlocked the limitation of the large language and opened the era of large language model, leading us to the hype that we know with generative AI, chat GPT, everything, and now responsible AI that everybody's uh, speaking about. And uh, the hype is not finished. It will continue tomorrow, maybe with a small, small uh, language model. The new frontier is the device, how to run AI on, uh, on a mobile phone. You heard the announcement from Apple, for instance. Uh, uh, agentic AI and large action model. But let's focus now on the large language model for now. Because we're in the hype and uh, I believe that uh, generative AI has, is a Linux moment. Okay, I'm an open source guy. I discovered open source uh, at the same time as discovered the internet in, wow, 94. I was a student, 1994. And to me, uh, it's, we, we have a lot of similarity now with uh, Gen AI. Uh, they both, and they, both of them, Internet included, but let's 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 go not go into these details. Uh, they both started in labs and uh, university, military labs or uh, universities, whatever, uh, where researchers uh, were and still are used to uh, share their work and uh, build on top of each other result. Right? Then it got adopted by individuals and the enterprises. Now we are in this stage uh, with billion dollars market. Everybody's trying to have a piece of the cake because uh, we speak about large, large, large amount of money, VCs and uh, all, all we heard about that. That's the hype. And uh, if it goes the same trend that uh, I observed with open source, for me, we reached the, sta the stage of commodities, meaning that LLMs and most of the, the, the bricks that we speak about today will become commodities for us to be able to uh, keep innovate on top of them, all right? But for now, it's, uh, we're not really in, the, in this stage. We are in between the, the two of the state. And so it's just like open source, but it's going much, much faster, all right? And if I compare it with open source, uh, it's interesting to learn from what we learned in the open source when you observe the open source, how it changed and entered the enterprise and changed the world, basically, to anticipate a few things and to analyze the dynamics between collaborative openness and commercial ownership, all the different way of uh, producing, shipping, using, reusing uh, large language models. And to do that, we need some clarity about the licenses. What can we do or not do with a model? What are the restrictions that we have uh, when we're using a model? Just like with open source. So I worked with the guys at home uh, in, my, in my company who are in R&D labs, and I asked them, okay, when you're trying to in insert AI and uh, more specifically a large language model into a product or an architecture, what should we look at to assess and evaluate the openness of the model, the, the, the level of freedom that we have when we want to reuse it, for instance, or use it? And we ca well, that's basic training steps, you know, with a foundational model and uh, pre-training, then the fine-tuned model and the fine-tuned uh, processing, and uh, when it's reinforced by human, uh, another uh, last stage, all right? He told me, 
first you have to check the model. And the model is not really the architecture of things or the architecture of the neural network because when you have the research paper, you basically you know how to do that when you're in, the, in this domain. What is important are the weights, so that's the result of the training, that's the configuration of the, 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 the neural network. Do you have access to that? Can you use it? Can you deploy it home? Can you modify it or not, right? Second part, data set. Whether it's the huge amount of data that are used to pre-train the foundational model, or the smallest uh, piece of data that is used to fine-tune and adapt the model to specific uh, behavior or uh, that kind of stuff, right? Second point to assess. Then, when the model is reinforced by human or now with new techniques of DPO, where you adapt the model with some parameters and stuff, you might have some intermediate component here called the reward model. Is it available? Do you know what's, what's going on in this model? Can you reuse it or modify it or not? And then uh, the data processing code also, and it's not the code implementing the neural network itself, it's all the heavy lifting to implement the processes. Is it available and is it easy for anybody to reproduce uh, all this training, all these processes to adapt or create their own version of the, the model? Based on that, we created this matrix where we score those different components or artifacts. So here you have model, the pre-training, fine-tuning data set, reward model, and data processing code. And with the scores going from zero, it's completely closed, black blocks, to four, it's totally open. It means that you can use it, you can reuse it, you can modify it, and you don't have any restriction about what you can do with that, right? And in between, you have one, it's uh, only described in a public uh, research paper, so it's behind a paper wall, let's say. Two, you can uh, have access to it, but it's restricted, whether you have to pay money behind the paywall, or you have to prove that it's for research only. So you have to be part of the, the research team or the research uh, world, let's say. And three, it's open, you can access, you can modify, but you have some restriction about what you can do uh, with the model. And based on that, what I propose from now on is to use this matrix and just to, to check and assess a few LLMs that are known or less known, just to illustrate the 50 shades that we can have uh, of, on uh, openness of uh, models today. So first, let's start with OpenAI because it was part of the, the, the beginning of uh, the hype, not the beginning of GenAI, yeah? but uh, of the hype. So basically, uh, hence the name OpenAI, it started as a non-profit uh, organization in the US, which intent was to improve uh, artificial intelligence for the wealth of humankind and stuff. So the first version uh, generation of the GPT model were, was quite open, the model was completely reusable, no, not, not that much information about data set and code, but still, all right? With the hype, so the post LLM hype, um, everything changed, uh, they closed everything. They didn't change their name though, but uh, everything is closed, so starting with version three and four and 4.0 now, you don't have access to anything, we don't know. And ChatGPT, which is, can be seen as a, a fine-tuned version of GPT for uh, chatting with humans, it's described in the research paper. So they really change from open research, open to completely closed, all right? And uh, you know also the partnership with Microsoft, investing indirectly billions of dollars for the infrastructure and that kind of stuff. So there's a big business here. As I said, we're in the enterprise stage of the evolution of the, of the Linux moment I was uh, speaking about, right? But there is something more. You have to read the licenses and the, the, the terms of use. And there is something that is written here that most people don't know. They say, don't use output from uh, OpenAI LLMs to train other commercial LLMs. So basically, you can't use OpenAI to train another model and make money with that. Do not compete with us. Just remember that because that, that, that will have an impact on other models or the other initiatives. Another uh, big player, Google. As I said, they changed a lot of things in 1917, uh, yes, with the attention is all you need. They did the open source uh, implementation called BERT. The model was open, the code also, data set, restricted access, right? But uh, they changed also with the hype, starting with the new generation of large language model with Palm 2 first and then Gemini now, 
where uh, basically it was closed. Published in a research paper, but closed. So at the beginning, it's just like, oh, they are doing the same thing as OpenAI, closing everything because there's a lot of money to make. But more recently, they changed their strategy and they also released in parallel now a model that they call Open Model, right? Which is called Gemma. And it's open, but with a few limitations that we will see. Uh, we don't have any information about the data set, might be the same maybe, that is used for Gemini training, we don't really know. Uh, but they did a lot of, of uh, they put a lot of effort to uh, provide tool chain to uh, allow anybody to train, fine tune, reuse uh, Gemma and uh, do their own version of models. I was in a workshop just a few minutes ago with Abdel doing, doing just that, right? So they changed a little bit their strategy, research, a lot business, and then they say, yeah, well, uh, let's not forget the, the, that openness and a collaborative way of doing things, right? But then I put a tree there, the limitation, because here comes the responsible AI, right? So it's, it's stated in the term of use, uh, you can't use this uh, Gemma or the, the derivative, so if you fine tune a model, so you, you derive a model from Gemma. You can't use it for illegal activities, blah, 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 blah. So do not do harm or evil by their definition, right? So as I said, I'm an open source guy. So to me, this contradicts the open source definition. That's why you can't say it's open source uh, AI, right? It's open in a way, right? I see Amanda, <laughs> we have some discussion after, yes. <laughs> well, that's my point of view at least. Right. Okay, but that's in interesting to, to know. Now, if we go uh, for the other players, I won't go into the details, I don't have uh, much time, but what, what are they doing? They are trying to, to catch up, of course, and to, mark the, the, to, to put their mark into this arena because there's a lot of money and nobody wants to miss the train. So all the big players now, whether they create their own model, whether it's closed or it's open, right? So you see Phi 3 uh, for Microsoft and small uh, language model, uh, Titan that is not that known, but from uh, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. But what they do also, they also partner for infrastructure, right? Because uh, you need a lot of uh, resources to uh, train the model and then to run them, do the inference part of the AI. And uh, so you need, you need to, to, to have access to that. So you, 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 we've seen a lot of partnership between, for instance, Microsoft and OpenAI, um, Amazon, uh, AWS rather, uh, with uh, Anthropic uh, providing cloud. Uh, IBM is doing its own thing. Apple just announced Apple Intelligence. Um, Oracle partner with Elon Musk and uh, XAI for, for Grok and other infrastructure-wise stuff. And the things are going on uh, also in China, for instance, with uh, Alibaba, right? But there is uh, one player I didn't speak about, is Mita. So Mita is not like the other one because it's not providing directly infrastructure. It's not a cloud service provider, right? Maybe that's why. Uh, they started like the, the others in uh, quite in the open with Roberta. So from the name, you can uh, you can infer that it was based on BERT and uh, the transformer architecture. It was quite open, uh, even on the data set. Uh, more uh, more effort were doing to were, were done to give more uh, details and access to the data set. But then again, with the post uh, generative AI hype, uh, they quite close a few things. So no more access to the data set or any code. But they did something that allowed people to reuse their model, Yama and Yama 2 then. Uh, so that, that, that was interesting, but you have, to, again, to read the, the notices, the licenses, the term of use. So for instance, there are additional commercial, commercial terms in the, in the Yama 2 uh, license, which states if you, uh, basically, if you start to, to make a lot of money with, uh, with uh, Yama, we want, we want part of it. You have, to, you have to contact us if you sell uh, something with uh, seven, uh, more than uh, 700 billion uh, active users monthly. Right? So that's a restriction. You have to know about that. All right? Because a lot of people say, yes, it's open source. Yeah, maybe it's open. Yes, we can reuse. But be careful, you can't do anything with that. They, they put a limitation there. And then they went a little bit further uh, with Yama 3 because they added this new uh, limitation on distribution and reuse. It's just attribution, you know. Now they impose people to say that model was built with Meta Yama 3. Uh, 
And in the name, you have to put Yamatri uh, as a prefix in the name of the derived model. So you see that it's a kind of uh, protective uh, clauses because uh, there's a lot of uh, money and uh, business going on. So you see that here, Meta also is uh, putting some, uh, some clauses to protect the business. But anyway, uh, they did allow people to reuse the model and to derive them. And that's what did uh, two universities uh, starting on the Yamatri upstream uh, foundational model uh, in the US with uh, Alpaca and Vicuna. So who said that uh, data scientists didn't have the sense of humor? Yama, Vicuna, Alpaca, what? But so they derived the level of openness according to my matrix eh? uh, from the upstream model. So the three and the one from uh, Yama2. And then what they did, they uh, gathered information to do the fine tuning. So they gathered information to create the fine tuned uh, data set. But what they did, they used results coming from uh, shared GPT. And shared GPT is a way to share results generated from OpenAI. So here, remember the limitation of OpenAI. Do not uh, use output of OpenAI to compete with us. So basically here, you have a limitation. So they inherit uh, two kinds of limitations, one from the model and another one from the fine tuning data set. Right? Uh, the code is under Apache 2 license. So uh, that's for anybody to use and, uh, and reuse. So basically, it's a research, uh, research uh, work uh, coming from universities, but it's not really adapted to commercial and uh, uh, creation of, uh, of, uh, of money with it. Right? Then, uh, here is a table. I won't go into all the details, but uh, here are uh, some examples of other initiatives. The, th the three first were uh, initiatives to create new foundational model that might be a little bit more open and allow uh, other initiatives and projects to build on top of it, all right, in the collaborative way. So the first one, uh, Elite AI, for instance, the model is completely open. Then Falcon and Blue, you have some, some limitation. Basically, it's a responsible uh, AI again. Then you see the data set there is more open. It's between three and four depending on the, uh, the limitation that you put on the usage uh, that you'll be, you will make uh, of the data set. And basically, the code is uh, available, or sometimes you have some examples or uh, some general instruction. All right? Uh, and you see that also you have, uh, it, it was done by research institute, but also by a uh, non-profit organization. And I put here Mistral, which is a good example because I will focus on it. And not just because uh, we're in France and it's a French-based, let's say, uh, company. Uh, where you don't have any information about uh, the data set, but yes, uh, you can reuse uh, some of their model. Right. So what to, what to, to, to remember here? Uh, data set fuzziness first. Here, please refer to the specific license depending on the subset you use. I think that I took that from the Bloom uh, model card on the hugging face. This because you know when you create this huge amount of uh, of data to, to do the pre-training, what you do you you take subset and then you assemble them, you aggregate them to train your model. And well, maybe it's because there are researchers and they don't really care about the licensing part of it. They didn't do the job about what can you do and what can't you do. So it's up to you to, to check. So be careful. We didn't do the job. It's, it's for you to check if, if everything is OK. So it can be a little bit fuzzy in this, uh, in this domain. And uh, regarding um, restriction also, if you take, for instance, Falcon, so a model that comes from the Emirates, all right, that says we are an Apache 2 license. So everybody is like, oh, yes, it's open source. That's nice. With a few modifications. And they do say, please read the license carefully. <laughs> because we had it something. You can't do Falcon as a service. Well, you can, but you have to come and, and discuss with us. Right? So again, protection. How to protect uh, your business. Uh, let's focus a little bit on Mistral, uh, because I find it very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, France is uh, known for its cuisine, and the cuisine is all about the sauce, at least in the uh, French cuisine. So it's uh, all about mixing ingredients. And that's what uh, Mistral is doing, mixing things. Very, very interesting. First, on the technical aspect, they mix the models with the, the mixture of expert uh, architecture, you know, put in parallel different uh, specialized models to have a bigger one, more efficient, etc., uh, etc. Et they also mix the, the kind of model that they produce or they offer, whether they're foundational or uh, fine-tuned, 
like Code Stral, for instance. But what is more, more interesting is the mix of business models, the way they, they provide and they, they deploy, they offer the models. So they have an open source, I put it between brackets, all right, uh, model. So that was the, the first model that they created, right? And uh, they also provide the SDK. They, were the, they spoke about that, or she spoke about that uh, this morning in the, in the keynote. And it's really nice because it's really to help people and really push people to reuse and fine tune, uh, just like uh, Google is doing with, uh, with Gemma, huh, and do the same kind of uh, effort. Then uh, they raised a lot of money also, and then they entered the, the arena of the commercial uh, APIs. So they have their own uh, small, large, and embed models. Okay, but it's not replacing, it's uh, adjacent to the open model offering that they have. And with CodeStral, they have a new concept that they call sustainable openness, uh, that is basically a non-production license. So yes, you can use, reuse it, uh, uh, but not in production. It's important to know. Uh, so two things to, to, to notice here. The first one is just like with open source, I see a rise of uh, innovation in the business models and something like community versus enterprise version. You know, it remembers me uh, a lot. We, we, we've seen that with maybe open core, those, those business models that we know in open source. Interesting to notice. First one. And then if you check the non-production license, for instance, they said, OK, it's only for research, uh, testing, personal evaluation purpose, but not for production. First thing. But then there is another clause that is, again, do not do uh, uh, Mistral uh, or Codestral, because it's on Codestral, as a service. No, so no SaaS. Uh, nothing, because then you have to come and discuss with, uh, with us. And that remembers me again, the same story and the same uh, drama that we had with uh, open source project fighting against cloud providers. You remember about first MongoDB, Elasticsearch, more recently Terraform. It's the same kind of stuff here. People want to protect their, their business or their asset or the value they, they create. So it's the same, like, uh, like open source. So interesting to, to notice that also. Right, so I spoke about foundational models. As soon as we have a quite or fairly open open source, uh, open uh, model, uh, then other people can reuse them and build on top of them. So here, some of them, some of them are quite old, it's, it's moving so fast. Um, but the, the, the first three, Dolly, Bloomchat, Defir, is interesting because they, they were fine tuned version of model d done or created by other parties, all right? So um, Dolly from Databrick uh, is based on uh, GPT-J from Elifer AI. Bloomchat, from the name you infer that it's from, uh, based on Bloom. And uh, Zephyr is a fine-tuned version of Mistral uh, done by Hugging Face, for instance. So they inherit also the level of openness from the upstream model on the model and the pre-training data set. And then, depending on the, the, the community and the, the business model and the way they did the things, uh, you have fine-tuned models, uh, fine-tuned data sets, sorry, that are more or less open. If you take Dolly, they created uh, their own data set and that allowed anybody else to reuse them. That's what did uh, Bloomchat. They reused the data set from Dolly. And Lion, that is another data set coming from a German community that is open, right? Uh, you have sometimes uh, people reusing output from OpenAI. So again, you have the same limitation as Vicuna and, uh, and, um, and uh, what was the name? Alpaca, the, the, other, the other name, all right? Uh, reward model, uh, sometimes you don't really have the information. Sometimes it's described in, uh, in papers. Sometimes you have some example, it depends, right? And the code generally, it's available. Uh, because we are in the, in the open collaborative community, so they are used to share uh, the, at least the code that that's, uh, reflects that they have. The two last ones are more recent, uh, because I did this presentation, that's why <laughs> I was speaking about Amanda, to, to the State of Open uh, earlier this year in London, and uh, I had to change uh, things, because uh, Gemma was out, uh, new models are, 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 are being released, and those are interesting because it's not fine-tuned version. They say we are recreating foundational model and then the fine-tuned model, because we're aiming to be more and more open. All right, so that's the, hence the name LLM 30 C, uh, 360, you know, that's, it's uh, 360 uh, openness. 
So basically, the model is completely open. We can reuse, transform, derive, whatever you want to do. The, the pre-training data set, the reusing data set uh, created by other communities, like Red Pajama, uh, Falcon, or Star Coders. They did, in this particular project, I don't know, uh, they reuse uh, output from OpenAI, so that's that, 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 that they do inherit some limitation then. Uh, no public information on the reward model, and everything is open source. And the last one is Olmo from uh, AI LN uh, Institute for AI. Um, interesting, because they now I think that Apple is saying that they are the most, with open ELM, the most open uh, version, but the formerly, <laughs> the former most open uh, LLM was this one, let's say. Uh, basically, everything is open, you can reuse, and uh, they did a lot of uh, work to, to clarify and to put the license uh, on, the, on the different artifacts. The only impact that you have is on the data set. Uh, they create on the, the pre-training data set called Dolma, they created an impact uh, version uh, and uh, for the fine-tuned data set also, Tulu. And uh, what is interesting, it's a DPO uh, LLM, uh, so it's an adaptation of, of the LLM. And even the parameters and the information, information used to do the adaptation is open source and is uh, uh, under MIT license, right? Uh, so that's interesting, but again, you have three here because you have some responsible AI uh, restriction uh, here coming up with uh, no military weapon uh, surveillance, uh, biometric processing, and uh, don't do things that we don't want you to do with, uh, with the model, right? So that's why you have a um, restriction there. Right, so it was about uh, coming, back, coming back to the Linux moment I was speaking about. So for me, uh, it's all because of this collaboration, uh, this uh, dynamism uh, in the ecosystem that are building up, uh, that uh, we have this, uh, this innovation, that these uh, new versions of model coming, uh, coming very quickly. Uh, and it's all based about licenses uh, at the end of the day for me. Uh, that's the, my, my angle, my vision. But uh, there are other uh, components of this uh, Linux moment, many, many other ones. I'd like to focus maybe on three of them. First, uh, collaborative tool and uh, ecosystem. We have this Linux moment because for the communities to be able to reuse the work of others, just like the, the researcher used to do uh, in uh, labs and universities, you need some platforms for them to do that very easily. So you have, for instance, Hugging Face, which is basically, let's say, the GitHub of AI, very easy to share uh, things. But you also have archive to exchange research papers. Right. Uh, you also have tools like Jupyter Notebooks, very easy for anybody, data scientist or not, to share recipe, to share uh, ways of training models, of using, uh, interacting with uh, LLMs. And you have also uh, Instruct uh, Lab, the new, new, uh, new initiative uh, from, uh, from Red Hat and IBM. But just to illustrate that people are trying to adapt the way of working in the community that is coming from the open source uh, yeah, way of doing things, to uh, AI, and the, the Git-oriented, the PR-like uh, way of contributing to a data set that is proposed by Instruct uh, Lab is very interesting from uh, that perspective, right? So that's the first one. The second uh, aspect of the Linux moment is the, all the work that is done on hardware optimization. So everybody, all, all the cloud service providers and the, the big players in infrastructure, they create their own AI ships. So GPU, LPU, you name it, PU. Right, um, but there are also also the things that are done on a software level with quantization, so mechanism to adapt, reduce the size of the model, and adapt them to other kind of architecture. May even allow uh, to run models on a, on a laptop or ship it in a container, and then start uh, building architectures with LLM inside, for instance. And Yama C++ is uh, one of the open source project that is very interesting from this perspective. Very, very easy to use, and it's used by many, many other uh, open source projects. Uh, and innovation is, is there, you know, when you have the collaboration, because right now the Yamaha C++ project is working, I think it's, it's going to be in the next version of the, of the framework on decentralization. So main, basically, you'll be able to run the, the LLM on multiple nodes. So you see that that opens a lot of possibilities also. And uh, we had this talk about Web3 and decentralization. <laughs> uh, could be interesting to check this out. 
it's not Web3, huh? it's just a way to, to decentralize things also. And the last aspect is uh, all the tools, frameworks, uh, open source tools and frameworks that are around the, the LLMs to ease the adoption of LLMs, the interaction with LLMs, or the reuse of them. Uh, and it's done in the Unix way. So let's say the open source way, which is do one thing well. So let's focus on something. I do it uh, pretty well. And I believe that other uh, people, project initiative, will work on something else on, on the side. And then we'll be able to combine them and to create a higher order solution. But by doing that, you generate or you need some standards to pro provide interoperability. So that's why with the Linux Foundation, for instance, you have the Onyx uh, standard to ease that, that kind of stuff. It's just a few examples there. Or you have uh, the GGML, which is the, the standard coming from uh, Yama C++. Just a few examples. Um, we also have uh, frameworks like Longchain, that is quite well known now, uh, that really ease uh, and, uh, and speed up uh, the use of, uh, of LLMs and integration uh, and, uh, and create uh, some workflows and, uh, and business rules around. And, and what is interesting in la with Langchain, for me, it's, uh, it represents the, the move that we have in, in this Linux moment I'm speaking about. Is it's starting in Python, which is the, the preferred language for data scientists, but then you have the adaptation of, uh, on uh, JavaScript. But, and then we speak now about Langchain for J, which might, I don't know if they will change the name at one moment, but uh, it's opening, it's going beyond Java. And that's good because it means that it, is, it becomes to be adopted by the larger community of developers. You have framework in Rust, in uh, any languages. It's out of the, the labs and out of the Python uh, world, even if in Python you have a lot of, of, of things available already. Right. Right. So. Just a key takeaway. I was quick on the on the tables and the details to to, to take time for the, the question after that. But just my, my conclusion will be uh, today uh, the spectrum of openness is quite wide. You have two two ways of, of of seeing that. The first one is you go from completely closed to uh, completely open or even free, like in freedom, not in free beer. All right, and in between you can have open ways. For instance, so be careful about what is open and what can you do with that uh, data set and upstream uh, transitivity. You can inherit the restriction that you have on the foundational model or on the data set, right? Whether it's the data set from the foundational model or the data set you use to fine tune, right? Be aware also of competitive clauses. So you see that some of the actors, they say, yes, we share, no problem, but uh, we want to protect our business, so do not compete with us or talk with us, so you, you start to, to make a lot of money, or it's for production only, or that kind of stuff. Be careful of that, because just like with open source, that's what I do in my, in my, in, uh, in my company. Uh, I go to the project and I say, yes, you use a lot of open source components, but are you aware about the licenses? Uh, are you okay with that? And uh, it's sometimes a lot of pain, you know, to go uh, afterwards and uh, to check uh, that everything is okay. So it's good to know those things before. It's easier to deal with, right? Uh, and you also have the responsible AI restriction. So of course, we don't want to, to, to create bad things and do evil and stuff. Sometimes you might have some restriction uh, that are not that bad, maybe. It's like, do not use this model to do health or health services. And maybe some people are doing things that are linked to health. So maybe you're in a fuzzy zone there. So you have to be aware of that. Okay. Uh, another way to, 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 to navigate this spectrum is to, to take the, the, the trend that I was comparing uh, Gen AI with uh, uh, open source and even internet, actually. So from open research, right, to competitive market, that's where we are. A lot of competition, everybody has the biggest model, uh, uh, and uh, the VC is there, and you speak about billions of dollars, euro, yen, whatever the, the currency you want, right? Uh, but um, we're in between here and the competitive ecosystem, and that's what I, uh, I observe, and that's what, that's what is interesting beyond the licenses and stuff. Licenses are interesting because the, they are the foundation for some of the business models. And uh, the example of Mistral, Mistral, or Mistral actually, is interesting because, uh, well, they do innovate by creating different business models, one that they call open or open source, another one that is commercial API, another one is non-production license, for instance. And you see a lot of partnerships um, 
to me, the, all that is possible because you have a certain level of openness somewhere. All right, so that's why you have to check what what the level is exactly. Actually, but open, openness fosters the reuse and collaboration, definitely. I hope that I proved that with the few tables that I have shown, and uh, in, in particular, the fine-tuned version derived the model from foundational models that were quite open before them. Uh, and collaboration brings commoditization. That's, that's my, uh, my point of view. So at the end of the day, those components, some of them, will become commodities, and th that will be then uh, for us to innovate on top of that as I said in the introduction. So it's just like open source, so why not learn from the open source? Because this time is going much, much faster, so let's try to anticipate some of the, 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 the results to cave out all the opportunities that, uh, that are arising here. So yes, AI love open source. Open source should, live, uh, should love AI also. And at the end of the day, it's just like open source. It's not like completely free, collaborative uh, uh, communities against big, bad, uh, wolf, uh, big companies. There, there's all the colors of the rainbow to make the, to make the world, and we see that here the innovation is also at play on the, on the business side. All right. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions. Amanda, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's recorded. Maybe well, let me let me give you the mic. I really like the comparison that you make between the Linux moment and the AI moment. And sometimes we've talked about three generations: the Linux generation, the Kubernetes generation, and the AI one. And you you sort of see that evolution. There are two things I would question in what you've said. You, you mentioned putting on a disclaimer. I think that comes with a risk, because if you say this is not suitable for X, it implies you know, and you, you are then potentially bringing liability to yourself. It's like saying I may be infringing a law by doing X, so I be, would be careful with that. The slide where I was shaking my head at you, can you go back to it? The one where you were looking at the AUPs, I just want to see if I'm right or wrong. Um, I, I think there's a piece that we have to remember where law trumps licensing. So just because something does a, something that is required to do legally doesn't mean it's breaching the license. Doesn't mean it's breaching. The, so the open source license is a choice on how you distribute the code. But if a law requires you to do something, you are required to do that, whatever you say in a license. So that doesn't undermine the license. But I think the rest, I totally agree with you. And um, have you seen the Dutch report that came out last week with the 14 criteria? It's very good. Thank you. Yes, it's always good to have Amanda here because she knows about the legal aspect of things. That's very nice. <laughs> Any other question? Oh, yeah, maybe, yeah. Because I can't see really. Oh, here. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Sarah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Just curious, as you mentioned, licenses on a the risk for a company not to respect that. And if you had like any example in mind of like legal risks and enforcement of really not respecting these licenses. Yeah, well, it's quite new and young. Uh, I don't know about legal enforcement. Uh, I know about threat and uh, people threatening, like you heard about Elon Musk that uh, <laughs> tried to attack open, uh, open AI and say, oh, you don't respect the original contract. And then he dropped everything a few, few weeks ago. So there's a lot of move because it's, it's, it's a business. You know? uh, I know also about, for instance, uh, TikTok. Uh, OpenAI uh, open de detected that uh, TikTok were using output from, uh, from OpenAI to train their own uh, LLM, so they, 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 they closed the uh, access. So it's, n it's not, it, it didn't reach for me really the legal side of things, and maybe we don't, uh, we don't really know how applicable this restriction will be in court and in which court just like open source, we have, we have to check that. So for now, it's a lot of uh, positioning, business positioning, uh, but I don't, don't really know examples except those you know, polemics and legal and threatening that we have uh, today, yes, between the different actors. Another question? Time, time up, all right. Thank you very much then. <laughs>